Up next, Doug and I look at the Hasselblad X1D 50C on the Camera Labs Photography Podcast. Hi everyone, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and no, you do not need to adjust your set. You are looking at me, not Mr. Doug K, because we have switched roles for this show, and I will be asking Doug the questions as he reviews the Hasselblad X1D 50C, a rather spectacular medium format camera. How are you, Doug? I'm doing very well, Gordon. Yes, this is the beast right here. And a beast indeed it is. That's an enormous camera you have in your hands. It, it looks like it, but I'll tell you right out of the shoot, you know, I got this from Hasselblad to do this review. It is not as large and as heavy as I expected. It is really not much different than a, than a Canon 5D Mark III, let's say, or something like that. I should say you have some pedigree when it comes to medium format cameras, for it is a medium format camera. Last time I went out shooting with Doug in San Francisco, he trumped me enormously by carrying not a medium format, but a large format plate. Was it? It's a plate camera, wasn't it, Doug? Oh, yeah. It was a four by five speed graphic. Yeah, this photo you can see was taken by our friend Suio, who uh, who managed to squeeze. I think she needed a very wide angle lens to, to squeeze in that enormous camera. You're not compensating for anything there, are you? No, no, I'm not trying to make up for anything at all. So you're pretty experienced this. And in fact, I, I also used to shoot on medium format on film. I've never shot medium format digital, so I'm very much looking forward to hearing what you think of this camera. So Doug, can you give us the top line? What is this camera and who's it for? Okay, so this is a camera. It's obviously for people who can afford it. It's an $8,000 camera. It was originally 9,000, but it's generally available for $8,000 in the US. It is, as Gordon said, they call it a medium format camera. Uh, but what that means is that it's larger than full frame. It's 51 megapixel sensor. It's 44 millimeters by 33 millimeters. So it's it's not really what we'd call medium format. And here, this is a real, what I'd call a medium format camera. It's a, 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 a Roloflex and it's six by six centimeters negative size, uh, quite a bit larger than the uh, Hasselblad. But in the world of digital, this has become what's known as medium format. Most of the medium format cameras are really this size. So to put to put that sensor size in perspective, a full frame sensor like you get in a Canon EOS 5D SR, Sony's A7 series, Nikon D850, that sort of thing, those sensors measure the same size as 35 millimeter film. So 36 by 24 millimeters. So if you got one of those sensors and put it on its side, and you kind of rounded 36 to 33 millimeters, then what, what you end up with is a sensor that's just under twice the size, isn't it? It's just under twice the area, the Hasselblad sensor, isn't no, it? No, it, it's, it's uh, less. Because if yes, you it's, had... So it's 67% it's, it's larger, so it's 167% mm. of the full-frame sensor size. So it's not quite as big. If you got your full-frame DSLR or mirrorless camera and put it on its side and did two of them, that's a bit bigger than the Hasselblad sensor just by itself. Um, but what this means, obviously, is then when you put a lens on it, the coverage for the same focal length becomes different, doesn't it? So when we talk about 35 millimeter equipment, when we talk about a 50 millimeter lens on full frame being a kind of similar magnification to the human eye, if you put a 50 mil on that Hasselblad, it actually becomes something else, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Uh, so a 50 millimeter on this becomes a somewhat wider angle lens just because of the sensor is going to get you a larger field of view. Um, I should say one thing about this that's of note is that the aspect ratio is four to three. So it's more like a micro four thirds camera. If you crop it to the normal three to two aspect ratio, you're only getting a 45 and a half megapixel image. So you know, if you're going to be shooting 4x3 format, if that's what you want to end up with, yes, you'll get your full 50 megapixels. But if you want to, want to compare apples to apples and you look at a standard full-frame camera, then you have to sort of discount some of this because you're going to throw away some of the pixels. So in terms of resolution, it's actually roughly comparable to the top end from, say, Sony, Nikon and, and Canon, because they're all up between the 40 and 50 megapixel mark. So what I'm hoping to hear from you throughout this video is that that bigger sensor means fatter pixels, maybe lower noise, better dynamic range, better image quality is what I'm hoping to hear you say. Uh, but I haven't yet exclaimed shock at the price of this camera. But so let's have it again. Eight grand, right? Eight thousand US dollars. And that's with no kid lens. So how much for a lens? All right, so the lenses, for example, this one here, this is a 45 millimeter lens. That's a, the equivalent of a 35 on a full frame camera. That's the, one of the least expensive. That's a $2,700 lens. But if you want to get, let's say, a 30 millimeter, which is the equivalent of a 24 on a full frame, that's going to run you $4,000 for these lenses. $4,000. 
they're they're pricey. That's right. And particularly of note about these lenses is they are not very fast. The fastest native lens you can get for this is the let me take a look the ninety millimeter, which is only f three point two. So when you're talking about speed, you're talking about the aperture, the focal ratio, not not the autofocus speed, right? That's right. Well, that's a separate issue altogether. Yeah. But yes, no, exactly. We're talking about the, the focal ratio uh, in that these lenses do not let in a particularly large amount of light when set wide open. Um, so anyway, the, the, the lens stable, just so we flesh that out, there's a 30 millimeter, which is a 24 millimeter equivalent. There's a 45 millimeter, which is the 35 equivalent. There's a 90 which is the equivalent of a 71 on a full frame. And the longest lens is a 120 millimeter macro, the equivalent of a 95, uh, but that's $4,500, that lens. Okay, so it's obviously not an insignificant investment, but is it shocking compared to other medium format digital cameras? What about its rivals? How much do they cost? Okay, so the, the, the rivals we've got out there closest is probably the Fuji uh, GFX, which I've had a chance to not fully test, and I look forward to being able to do that in the future, but a friend had one, and we had breakfast, and I compared them side by side. That camera is $6,500, so it's about $500 less than this one, uh, but it's a, it's a large, hev larger and heavier camera. And it's got the same size sensor and the same resolution sensor as well, hasn't it? Yeah, I'm even suspicious they might be from the same manufacturer, but I have no way to support that. Okay, okay. what other medium format cameras can we talk about? Right. Well, uh, the ones that we used to think about are the larger Hasselblads and the phase one digital backs that you get. Uh, you know, the Hasselblad, the HD5 200C uh, is a $45,000 camera. All right. So what? why? I, Gordon, I have no idea. This is Has not nobody world, asked this question? This is not a world I live in. But the, the whole idea of the GFX... Oh, don't spoil and, it, Doug. I like, the, to, this, I like to picture you and your private jets after these chats. That's right. Well, again, this is my medium format camera, which I got, you know, for $1,600. So that's... A, and that, that was an expensive uh, Roloflex. But, you know, it, it, the thing about the GFX and the, H, the X1D from Hasselblad is they're bringing what we call medium format down to something that they want to call reasonable. Mm. And so getting below the $10,000 mark is actually a, a bit of a breakthrough in this marketplace because you've got things like the digital backs that phase one makes. Just looking at some of these, uh, the IQ250 digital back, $35,000, same sensor size again. Uh, the phase one XF100, $49,000. That's a, a, my notes say 10 megapixel, but I know that it's a 100 megapixel camera. Um, that's actually got a 50% larger sensor area than these others, but it's $49,000. Um, so anyway, that, that's a perspective of where this medium format market comes from. Now, I remember, I remember ages ago when I used to live in New Zealand, I, I borrowed a phase one uh, back that had 80 megapixels. And at the time, I also had a, a Nikon D800, not the D810, because that hadn't been uh, released back then. And I did that test where I, I put the D800 on its side and took two pictures like a panorama and stitched them together and then took one frame with the phase one. And they, they contained you know roughly the same amount of pixels. But the interesting thing was is that the um, the Nikon at the time had a low pass filter, so there was a kind of softening to the image. Whereas the medium format, because this was always a differentiator back then, that most of the medium format sensors didn't have low pass filters, so they were very, very, very crisp. Now these days, most high end sensors, uh, even on full frame or APS-C, don't have um, low pass filters either. But back then, it was it was almost like a veil had been lifted. So this is on the medium format version. So even then, because I was skeptical when I, I thought, you know, if I can be bothered to stitch two full frame images together, am I actually going to get there? Uh, and the answer is I didn't. Uh, the um, the phase one image looked a lot better. But that was when those full frame cameras did have uh, low pass filters these days none of them do so just just before we move on doug how much are we looking at really for um for one of these full frame dslrs or mirrorless cameras yeah you've got um the sony a7r mark iii that i literally tested side by side with this um thirty two hundred dollars so it is let's take a look it's less than half the price i can buy two a7r mark iii's for the price of this camera um then you've got the canon eos 5ds R, R for remove the filter, I guess. Must I thought it was R for really good. Huh? Yeah, R for really good. Yeah, maybe that's it. Well, again, they charge $200 to take off that filter. 
It's not quite that simple, but <laughs> exactly. it, that's a thirty-seven hundred dollars, fifty-one megapixel full-frame camera, and the Nikon D eight fifty, also a, very much a contender here. Uh, again, less than half the price, three thousand three hundred dollars. So you've got Sony, Nikon, Canon with cameras that really are in many ways in the same ballpark. And we'll talk a little bit later about the image quality and how they compare. Yeah, and uh, those cameras have got a lot of frills compared to your typical medium format cameras. So as we discuss this, we'll sort of uh, compare that. You know, when if you were to buy, especially say the Sony, you know, you're getting built-in stabilization, 4K video, big electronic viewfinder. You're getting ton, tons of uh, tons of features on there. Wi-Fi. I'm very interested to know whether whether this camera has got many of those new features. So Doug, can you take us around the physical design of this camera because it does actually look quite modern and quite unique for a medium format body. Yeah, it's, I think it's a beautiful camera. It's uh, designed and made in Sweden. It's a minimalist design, but it's very modern. As I say, it it's not as heavy as you might think. I mean, I'm holding it in my hand and it's really heavy, but a lot of that is the lens. Um, so it's an interchangeable lens camera, as we mentioned. The one thing that's strange about that is that you see the lenses all have this big focusing ring here. And the focusing ring goes so far back towards the flange that when you want to mount and dismount the lenses, it's very hard to grab them here. You end up having to grab the lens way out mm. here in order to dismount it and properly mount it. You can see that. Shows that sensor. big, lovely sensor. Oh, yeah, look at the size of this thing. All right, look at that. That body actually looks really thin. Now I, now I think about it, because a lot of medium format cameras that I'm used to have got bigger, kind of chunkier bodies. No, it's it's very nicely designed in that regard. I mean, it's really well put together. But again, see, I put the lens on, I go to tighten it here, and I can't because I'm turning the focus ring, so I have to hold it out here. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to put the lens on and not fully get it to click and engage. Now, it's, mir it's mirrorless, isn't it? The, this is not a focal plane shutter. That's one of the reasons the body is so narrow. That's right. It's um, uh, The shutters are in the lenses, and they're quiet, and they work just fine. So let's get to take a look. So we've got the... The button here to remove the lens we have a depth of field preview button right down here which works very well uh, on the top deck we have a typical pasm dial that's the um, the shooting mode dial uh, we have the shutter release we have a front wheel that's soft control we have a rear wheel that's a soft control also on the top deck are really just um, uh, there's the power switch here and then we have two buttons and these buttons are specifically made or typically made for autofocus and uh, manual focus switching. And then again, a quick way to get to the ISO and white balance controls. But let's try this. Let's turn it on and see what happens. All right. So I'm going to turn on the camera. I'm looking at the rear now. All right. Just turned it on. One elephant, and two elephant, three elephant, four elephant, five elephant, six elephant, seven elephant, seven or eight elephants. Yeah, it's, it's eight elephants by the time it fully starts up. So this is not a quick startup. This is not a quick anything camera for that matter. When it goes to sleep, does it go to power? Can it go to power save? Does it take a long time to wake up from that? No, no, it's not bad. Once it's in power save mode, you just give a half click to the shutter release button and it comes back to life. So that's fine. But if it does, yeah, uh, it's not bad at all for that. What about composition? You mean in terms of how to compose? Yeah. Does it have a viewfinder? Yeah, so it has electronic viewfinder, which is quite nice, very bright. Uh, and then it has a rear LCD. Now, the first thing you see about the rear LCD is the menu system. It is a touchscreen interface. Now, let's take a moment to talk about this. This camera has an all-new interface. This is not like a menu or touchscreen interface of any other camera. They've done actually a brilliant job on it. It's more like a smartphone. We've seen a couple of cameras like that in the past. The touchscreen works very well. Um, to give you an idea of how we might use this, let's see if I can show it. If I want to switch from uh, auto... This is hard to do. Welcome to my lots, world of pain. Lots of practice. I can. The problem is I don't see this on my screen very well. So here we go. So if I want to change autofocus modes, I can go there and I can switch from one autofocus mode to the other. Just I mean, that, that looks really modern. I mean, like you say, that's a kind of smartphone type interface. That, that's ahead of a lot of uh, DSLR and mirrorless cameras. Oh, no, it's really nice. Really a nice interface. Somebody did a brilliant job. If I'm here and I'm looking at the preview and I just scroll down like that, I get to that menu. Uh, obviously, I can do things like pinch, uh, pinch and spread to zoom on my images. I can scroll to the Im images horizontally with a swipe and so forth. All the things that you'd expect but I can get to everything very quickly through the menu system. It also, of course, gives me a touch uh, ability to select a focus point for autofocus. 
Um, it's a very, very nice display, and the whole user interface is quite well thought out. Now, it, the camera did fail in one department. It failed in the, can I use it without ever opening the manual department? That's one of my tests for a camera. And I got to a certain point where, no, there are certain things I couldn't do without opening the manual. So it's not, it's not perfect. It's not totally intuitive, but it's pretty damn good. And once you do get used to it, uh, it's pretty quick to, to work around. Uh, it has two buttons on the rear uh, for automatic exposure lock and autofocus lock. Um, it has on the side, it has dual SD slots, right, which you can sort of see there. And then it has uh, HDMI, USB. Eh, it doesn't show up very well, does it? HDMI, USB, and microphone and headphone jacks. So that obviously, unless they're playing a, a cruel trick on us, it's got a movie mode, right? It does have a movie mode, but not one you'd ever want to use. We'll talk about that later, right? We will talk about that later. Okay. And then, and then the rear panel has a number of buttons along the side there, as you see. Uh, I hope you can see. And they're, they're soft buttons, but they're more or less obvious what they're dedicated to. You know, there's a play button. There's one to control the display. Uh, there's one to quickly get to the menus and so forth. So control-wise, it's pretty good. Does that screen, now it's touch sensitive, but does it tilt? Uh, no. And I'll tell you, I miss that a lot because... When you're looking down on the camera, you can see how the profile of the viewfinder is such that it blocks the screen, which is true for a lot of viewfinders uh, with the cup that's on there, the eye cup. But uh, I really do wish that, you know, w when you shoot models, for example, you shoot in a studio, you're often working with the camera at a fairly low position. That's relatively common in this kind of, for this kind of camera. If I'm tethering, if I'm tethered to a laptop or some like a monitor, that's fine because I'm going to look at that. But I really do wish that the camera would tilt, uh, the LCD would tilt. That would really help quite a bit. I wanted to ask you about tethering. So there is presumably tethering software for computers. Is there, is there also uh, the opportunity to control it with your smartphone? Yeah, it has a, it has a, a, a smartphone app. It has Wi-Fi. I would say it's pretty much standard. There's nothing exceptional about it. You can change the settings. You can take pictures. You can play back. You can do sort of the standard things. Not an, I think you're more likely to want to use this in a hardwire tethering situation because this camera really is more designed for sort of studio use than it is for... Certainly not as a, as a street camera, let's say. And is that going over USB when you're tethering? Yes. Um, can you charge over USB? That, you know, I don't know that. I, oh, you know, I don't know. But let me tell you something about these batteries. Because there thing. is something funny about the battery, isn't there? The batteries are fascinating. Uh, there's no battery door. What there is, is this device. You push the little lever and the battery pops out halfway, partway. And then you push it, it clicks, and then it pops out all the way. So here's the battery. It has a weather sealing ring around the edge. But what's really interesting about the battery is if you can see it, is there's that little hole there. See that jack mm -hmm. right there? All right, that jack is for the charger. So you plug mm. in a charge. The charger looks like a, a dumb power brick. Uh, but actually you plug in the little plug in there and then there's an LED on the charger that shows you the charge state, whether it's charging, fully charged, etc. cetera. Uh, which is not bad. Just takes a little getting used to, but it's actually very nice. So then the batteries just pop back in. So is there any dance? I mean, are they just being fancy or for fan for design's sake, or is there actually a benefit or a downside to not having a, ba a battery door? Well, I'll tell you, if you've ever broken off a battery door mm -hmm. for a camera, and I have, then you see an advantage. Uh, you know, look at it this way. It's, an, it's one less partially moving part. And you noted that, you, sh you showed that there was weather sealing on the bottom of that battery. Is the body weather sealed as well? You know, I don't know what they advertise, but certainly if you look at the various doors and so forth, they have little seals around them. Uh, okay. You can sort of see that. So I think that it is somewhat weather sealed. But, you know, who's going to take an $8,000 camera out in the rain? Not too many of us. I just wanted to ask you, again, to go back to the composition again, uh, because a lot of mirrorless cameras uh, are really, you know, pushing, raising the bar, uh, pushing the envelope in terms of viewfinder resolution and magnification and quality and lag and all of these things. How does that viewfinder compare to them? I mean, is it sort of roughly comparable to what you'd see on the A7R Mark III, or would you say it's bigger, slower, smaller? No, I'd say, I would say the 
the viewfinder and the rear LCD are as good as anything you'd expect from a DSLR. They're responsive. This is in still picture mode. Video is a whole different animal. But in still mode, they're quite good. Um, on the other hand, for all sorts of reasons, this isn't a camera that you're going to use where there's a lot of motion. Uh, I'll give you another example of that. We looked at the startup time, for example. Let's wait for eight elephants and we'll get started up again. And once we do that, I'm going to take a picture and I'm going to hold this up to the microphone so you can hear what's going on. Here we go. And three, two, one, go. All right. Now that was relatively fast, but in fact, there's a lag of about a second on most exposures. And that means from the time you hit the shutter release, it's almost one second until your exposure actually happens. Well, what you're going to get is, let me try it one more time looking this way. Here we go. Three, two, one, go. That last click was the one that actually took the shot. Uh, and that's confusing because you'll point the pointed at something, you'll push the button, you'll hear a click, you'll move the camera, and all you have is a blurry image because it actually exposed during a part of that process that you didn't realize. Now, that sh that leaf shutter was was reasonably quiet, but there was, there was something very noisy just before it. Is that the auto-focusing motor? Uh, well, it's what it is, is remember that the lens has to the lens has to be wide open for focusing. The lens has to stop down for the exposure. And so what you're hearing is a combination of the lens stopping down and the shutter. So it's a, it's a combination of many things going on. So this camera, would you say that, I mean, it's not an action camera, is it? You're not going to be shooting sporting events with it, but as a street photographer, did you find it too slow for street? Uh, I didn't even try. It was so bad. Let me, let me give you an idea of one other thing here. This is, we're talking about frames per second. No, no, let's talk about seconds per frame, okay? So here, I'm going to photograph. I'm going to do images as quickly as I possibly can. Here's one. There's the second one. There's another one coming up soon. So what is that? That's a little more than one second per frame. Mm. Um, so, you know, you're not going to get things very quickly. Does it completely fill up the buffer while you're doing that? Is it now? Is there now a little light flashing on the back and the poor SD card is melting? No, no. I mean, the images are about, what are they, 100 and some megabytes, 105 megabytes or so for each raw file. Um, but let's see what happens when I do that. I guess in terms of pixels and data, it's just wrangling the same amount as a Canon 5DS is doing. It's, they're, That's they're, right. both handling 50 That's megapixel right. files. It's a little bigger because they're full 16-bit raw files. They're not compressed. They're not 14-bit or 12-bit files. They're full 16-bit files. So they are, like I say, about 105 megabytes. Anyway, so, you know, you're looking at more than one second per, per exposure. So it's not an action camera. You're not going to shoot sports or things like that with this camera, I don't think. Uh, you asked about some of the mirrorless features. It has almost none of them. It's a contra contrast detection autofocus, which as you know, as you always remind people, is accurate, but not necessarily fast. And it has a little bit of hunting. Uh, on the other hand, the autofocus of the camera is quite good. Um, what's really nice up to a point is the manual focusing on this camera. It has peaking. Uh, you can zoom in so you can focus very accurately. But like so many of these cameras, we don't talk about this too often because manual focus isn't what most people use. But it's a focus by wire is what I call it, which means there are no distance markings on the lens. There's no depth of field scale. And when you turn this one way or another, the focus changes with it. However, because it's focused by wire, it's not repeatable. And that mm -hmm. means if you turn it 10 degrees to the right and 10 degrees back, you don't necessarily come back to the same position. They're being too smart. They're looking at things like how fast you turn it. They're looking at the acceleration of what you do and trying to figure out what you want. Well, that's really not very good for manual focusing. You really would like the repeatability, I think, where you can basically go do your own hunting, right? You go back mm -hmm. and forth and back and forth and you sort of find that middle point where you think it's going to be the sharpest. That's not easy to do when you have focus by wire. And I, I wish people would get away from that.
but this is the case with so many cameras these days, especially mirrorless cameras. It's it's the norm that that they work this way, and there's fewer and fewer lenses that are actually what they what they describe as being mechanically linked. And I I originally got into photography through astrophotography, where you really do want to be able to set a lens's focus and and make sure it stays there, even if the camera switches itself off and on again. And that is so frustrating on modern cameras. Even when there's a menu setting that says, I promise to return the focus to the same point. I'm like, really? Can I trust you? So I end up refocusing it again every time. And then or, or you to avoid that, you turn the power saving off so that it, it stays awake for half an hour and then the battery goes on it. And you're like, oh, why can't you just you know, let me adjust it mechanically? But, you know, that's that's the that's the kind of way of the world now. I wanted to ask you, though, because this is a camera kind of more designed for more considered photography, like, say, landscapes or studio work. Are there lots of visual aids that you can use? You mentioned focus peaking. Are there alignment grids? Um, are there uh, leveling gauges? Things like that. Because when I used to shoot with rangefinder medium format, I, I could never get the horizon straight. So I really do use those uh, alignment grids and, and leveling gauges. Does it have those? Yeah, it does. And they're very, very easy to select and quite good, actually. Let's see if I can show you some of them here. Um, hey, who's that good looking fella? Really? So we're in playback mode. So that's why we've got a good looking fella. Let's go to non-playback mode and i will show you some of those there is a um i'm there's not sure grid. which one you're seeing there's the grid okay yep. and there's the level the level is really a good level the best level i've ever seen they're nice camera. graphics as well aren't they they're very modern oh yeah look at that right it's a i mean that game. is like you say it's like a kind of smartphone interface they've, they've done a lot of work on these graphics yeah very very nicely done now, when we were talking about focusing, I was quite impressed to hear that you you could actually move the focusing area with the touchscreen because the last medium format digital I used, admittedly, a long time ago, this was before the GFX. I think it had three AF points. It reminded me of like my first autofocus SLR. You know, we 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 now say, oh, we're so used to having fifty autofocus points, or you know, you can tap anywhere on the screen. But you know, back in the day, the first autofocus cameras had one AF point or three, and uh, media yeah. format continued like that for a while. So this, you really can tap. You can you can focus pretty much anywhere on the frame. Yeah, of course. Now now I'm challenged to bring it up properly, but here we go. What you get is you, you don't get anywhere. You get this matrix of possible locations. I see. And you can, you can pick them and decide which one you want to use for autofocus that way. Is there, um, fa is there face detection? No, there's no face detection. There's none of the smarts that you typically expect from a mirrorless camera. Um, none, of the, none of those features that we say you can only get with mirrorless, like face detection, eye detection, you know, uh, tr trigger the shutter when someone smiles. N this camera is not anywhere close to that. It doesn't have any of those features whatsoever. It doesn't have a pic no pixel shift mode, but it does have a 51 megapixel sensor. Exactly. Presumably the autofocus is single AF only. There's no continuous AF. Uh, that is correct. That is correct because there's no continuous shutter mode either. There's no burst mode. No, but you could be somebody going for that decisive moment. You could have it on because the Canon uh, point and shoot used to be like that. You used to be able to turn on servo AF, which would autofocus, but then it would only let you do, say, one shot with it. This was a long time ago, but, you know, you could say there's the decisive moment, but it was autofocusing until that point. So, again, it's a considered, considered sort of camera. Do you want to tell us anything more about the general handling and autofocus? The only thing about the autofocus, like I say, it's a contrast only system and it's not fast. It's accurate, but it's not particularly fast. So, uh, again, really good for things that aren't moving. <laughs> like me most of the time. I want to, can we move on to image quality? Because that's, that's the thing we want to really talk about. This camera is twice, more than twice the price of, uh, you know, a, a, a typical full frame DSLR or mirrorless camera, yet it seems to have the same number of pixels on it. So, how does the image quality compare? Talk, talk us through it. Okay. So if there's one feature that would cause someone to buy a camera like this is that the images are gorgeous. There's no doubt about it. Um, the RAWs look good. The JPEGs look good. You can shoot in RAW or RAW plus JPEG. You can't shoot in JPEG only. Uh, but I would guess that most people are just going to shoot in RAW with the camera anyway. Images are beautiful. Colors are excellent. Auto white balance works very well. I tried it in a variety of situations with different lighting conditions and it picked up the white balance very well. Um, dynamic range is superb. Uh, one of the best cameras I've ever used. So there is no question that the image quality is excellent. Um, one of the things that bothered me a bit about the camera was 
Oh, one of the reasons I had to pick up the manual was it advertised it could go to ISO 25,600. But when I went into the menus, it stopped at 3,200. And I said, why can't I go past 3,200? Well, it turns out it defaults to using the electronic shutter instead of the leaf shutter. Uh, and the uh, higher ISOs, as well as flash, are only available with the leaf shutter. So you have to actually go in and turn off the uh, electronic shutter and, and get the leaf shutter to come on. Is there any is there any benefit to using the electronic shutter? Why would they default to that? I mean, I know on some cameras it offers complete silence, but obviously this camera's going, zzz, zzz, so there's no... Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I, I can't think of an advantage, but... Sometimes there's a penalty on, on some cameras. They actually reduce the dynamic range or the, the raw bit depth when you're shooting electronically. So I think that's interesting that they would default to that. But now it may be, it may be I, uh, one thing I didn't test is to see whether the electronic shutter will go to higher shutter speeds. That's a possibility, but I didn't check that out. Uh, that's something we see sometimes. But, you know, leaf shutters are quite fast because they're so small. Um, so th that's not really an issue. So the ISO range is 100, 100 ISO to 25,600. Yeah. Now, when I last tested medium format, which again was a long time ago, it was brilliant at 100 ISO. And then at 200, it was terrible. And at 400, it was game over. And I was like, oh, um, I'm going to bother with like 800 or 1600. Is that the same sort of thing here? I also wanted to ask you about um, auto ISO, because that's something that I, having initially been um, skeptical about, is now something I use all the time. I generally, you know, I love auto ISO. So actually, they work very well together. Uh, the, the images look terrific up to ISO 3200, which is that point at which they stop unless you switch to the leaf shutter anyway. Uh, they look excellent at 3200, very little noise. Uh, when you go above 3200, yes, of course, you start to see noise like you would in anything else. But I was very, very impressed as it goes higher and higher. Um, because it goes to 3200 and the images at 3200 are nearly as good at, as ISO 100, that's why you want to take advantage of that auto ISO feature. Let it cap out, max out at 3200 and just shoot away and not worry about it. Uh, one of the things that some cameras do well and some don't is one of the things I like to do is I like to shoot in manual mode, but auto ISO. And that means I select the shutter speed, I select the aperture and let the camera figure out the exposure by adjusting just the ISO. This camera will not let you adjust ISO in manual mode. Now, that's an easy thing for them to fix in a firmware update, and they have already released firmware updates to this camera. I expect there'll be more coming in the future, but that's one thing I'd like to see them add because there's no reason it shouldn't be able to do auto ISO in manual mode. Yeah, I really hope they fix that in a firmware update because I'm a, I'm a big fan of shooting in the same way, manual uh, aperture and shutter and then letting the camera work it out with auto ISO. But I think another trick I've seen you do, Doug, is where you actually deliberately shoot at a higher ISO and then, and then bring it down in post or, or kind of move it up and down do you still do that? Well, there's this concept called ISO invariance. And I think we've talked about it very briefly. But let's say you're going out with this camera and you set up the shutter speed and the aperture for what you want. And it turns out it's ISO 3200. So you can shoot that at ISO 3200 and get the picture you expect. Or you can bring it down to 1600, one stop. You can bring it down to 800, two stops. You can bring it down to 400, uh, three stops. And you can shoot this at ISO 400, Three stops underexposed, you get a nice dark image, you bring it into the post-processing raw, uh, raw software like Lightroom, you bring it up three stops, and you have an image that looks every bit as good as the uh, image that you shot at ISO 3200. Now, very few cameras do that. The Sony A7R Mark III does it. Um, the, this camera does it. We found a couple of other cameras that have that ability. I'm not saying you have to take advantage of it. It's more of a peculiarity than anything else. But the fact is that boosting the ISO in the camera versus boosting the exposure in post-production gives you the same results. And that again, that's not for every camera, but it's certainly true of this one. So is the benefit of that is that it just gives you more kind of flexibility after the event if you've accidentally shot at the wrong ISO. There's no penalty to shooting at too low an ISO and then maybe maybe fancying your chances then realizing you have to boost it. And there's none of this, oh, no, I wish I'd actually shot natively at 3200 on the camera. Yeah, it's easy to think that you might get benefits like, oh, well, then I can use a faster shutter speed or I can use a, a small aperture. That doesn't work out if you do the math. What you can do, though, is by underexposing, by reducing the ISO, 
is that you're going to get more highlight protection. So if you're if you're concerned that the camera is not going to save all the highlights for you, you can underexpose by a stop or two, and not worry that when you bring it up, the shadows are going to get ugly. Well, which leads us neatly on because I would hope with a with a sensor this big, with a price this high. That the pixels are so fat and capable that there should be no dynamic range issues. They should contain all, all shadow and highlight details. So you had a chance to actually shoot alongside with uh, with the full frame Sony A seven R Mark III. Is that correct? Correct, I did. So I've got to ask the question. I'm gonna. Well, I'm gonna. I want you to mention um, resolution. You know, which I assume is going to be pretty much the same, although obviously dependent on the lenses and diffraction as well. Uh, um, noise levels at similar ISOs, and also dynamic range, if you can, you know, uh, colors and sort of tonal range and, and processing. So go about that in any order you want. Uh, how does the image quality compare between these two cameras? All right. Well, dr drum roll, please, because this is the big, this is the big reveal, isn't it? The question is, when I, when I set out to do this review, let me back up and say that I, I said, you know, I'm not going to be able to do a full Gordon Lang, in-depth, technical, everything you possibly wanted to know about this camera review. I think you've um, done a good job. I think you've done a fine job. Well, thank you. Thank you. But this is the video version. There's not the 3,000 word written version that's going to come along with it. <laughs> but um, I assumed that for more than double the price and for all the hype about medium format that I was going to be able to get images that were vastly superior, or at least somewhat superior. As I said, the images from this camera are gorgeous. Are they better than, let's say, the A7R Mark III or the Nikon D50 or the Canon, what's it called? 5DSR. Yeah, thank you. The 5DSR. I can never remember all those letters. Um, the answer is no. It is not substantially better. So what did I do? I went out and I shot at the same ISO, uh, the same apertures, the same shutter speeds with this and the A7R Mark III. I brought them up in Lightroom. I looked at them side by side, one to one. I looked at them two to one. And because the Sony is 42 megapixels and this is 50, uh, you can actually compare them pretty much apples to apples. They're only slightly different when you look at them one to one. Yes, there is a slight improvement in almost every area. Well, not almost every. I would say color is slightly better, although Sony's most recent cameras, the colors are spectacular. I just love them. Um, dynamic range, a little bit better. However, noise, it's not any better. And you would expect by those somewhat fatter pixels you'd get better noise uh, at the high ISOs than you do with a, a Sony or a Canon. You do not. Actually, above 3200, the Sony starts to pull away and gives you better higher ISO, higher ISO images than you get from this Hasselblad. Um, and they're so close in terms of everything else. Dynamic range is close. Color is close. And of course, color's not too hard to correct. Uh, if you're using a camera like this, you're probably doing some post-processing and you're not afraid of doing a little bit of tweaking in post. This is not a typically a JPEG out of camera uh, type of device. So um, noise is something you, you, you can't necessarily undo noise. You can't make the two comparable. So I would say there is not a substantial improvement of this over uh, the high end full frame cameras. Surely there must be more dynamic range, though. I mean, did you push and pull the the tonal ranges of them? Did it does it stand up better to it than than the full frame cameras? I I did, and again, slightly better in the dynamic range. I don't think you'd be able to say it's a full stop. It's less than one stop difference in dynamic range. Really? Now, yeah, and I have you know I have the Sony A9 as well as the A7R Mark III. I don't have the Mark III right now, but. You know, the, the A9 is not quite as good as the A7R Mark III also. It's about a stop worse in dynamic range. Um, and the A9 even does almost as well as this camera. That's the sound of collective disappointment. Well, yeah. I mean, let's go back to the question of who's this camera for? What are you going to buy? Why would you buy this camera? Well, let, let's kind of, well, can I ask you another question? So, so, so in terms of resolution, in terms of resolvable detail, you'd say it's roughly comparable or directly comparable to 50 megapixel full frame. Yes. In terms of noise, roughly similar up to, you know, 3200-ish ISO, at which point the full framers with all of their sensor technologies actually go ahead. In terms of dynamic range, the did a tiny little bit better, but not significantly so. That's the right. one thing that we've not really mentioned, though, is the difference in perspective, because 
obviously it's a bigger sensor with a longer focal length lens in order to deliver the same field of view. Does that make a difference or is that something you could actually kind of not simulate, but achieve by using faster lenses, you know, in terms of depth of field, the the lenses that you've described for this system are optically quite slow. You so there's no kind of real depth of field benefit, is there? Uh, you could you could have much shallower depth of field on your on your full framers. You could you could uh, close down the aperture more easily because you've got stabilization and stuff. I mean, I'm trying to think if there's any benefit over full frame because of the bigger sensor in terms of perspective and focal length and and focal ratio. It, that, is that is that a reason to go for it? Well, I know where you're going. I mean, that's generally what one of the reasons that we prefer larger sensors over smaller sensors is because the the larger sensors allow you to get a shallower depth of field with the same focal length lens. Um, well, no, that's not quite true. The same focal length lens is always going to give you the same mm. depth of field, but because the larger sensor is going to allow you to use uh, different aperture. Your the theory is you can get softer focus in your backgrounds. And you're using a longer focal length for the same coverage. Right. Right. So if yeah. I wanted you to be the same size on the frame, then I would be using a longer actual focal length on the larger format sensor because because of the way that works, and that in turn changes the way it looks. Yeah. I mean, the fact is that a 45 millimeter lens has the same depth of field regardless of what camera you put it on, but this 45 millimeter lens is a 35 millimeter equivalent. So I'm going to compare this field of view at 45 millimeters to a full frame camera at 35 millimeters. The 45 millimeter has a shallower depth of field. So with the same field of view, you get a shallower depth of field with this camera, right? But That's the, thing. the focal ratio of that lens is f3.5, right? That's right. So Whereas you can buy 35 millimeter full frame lenses that go to f1.4. Yeah. And, and for a couple of hundred dollars, you can certainly get one that's F2.8. You yeah. Know? So, um, so there's not really that advantage uh, because, again, the lenses are, uh, in terms of light transmission, they're, they're slow lenses. Now, you've got some other lenses. You've got the older Hasselblad uh, H-series lenses you can put on with an adapter, manual focus only. Uh, I don't have any experience with those lenses, but there's obviously a, a bit of a history of those lenses, but they're expensive also. I'm struggling to find a benefit. <laughs> yeah. the bene One of the benefits people have said is that, I know this is crazy, that it's a bit more ponderous, that it's slower. Uh, it's, I, I know, I know. It's going to slow you down in the studio. I mean, look, if I had a business where I was photographing products in a studio, or if I was a strictly landscape photographer, this might be a camera for me. Uh, but I would not want to necessarily use it with models in a studio because shooting, you know, less than one shot per second isn't going to give me the kind of relationship with my models that I want to have, which is, all right, got it. Now, wait, 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 got it. Now, wait, wait. You know, I don't want that. I want something that shoots more quickly. Landscape, fine. How does it compare to Sony's? You know, I, what I didn't compare, and I probably should have, is compare this to the Sony A7R Mark III with pixel shift mode to see if I could squeak out that last bit of difference and make it look quite as good as this camera. But they're so close anyway, I don't think you have to bother. So, studio for things that don't move and landscape where you want to pay double the price to get that last 2%. Two, <laughs> two it's like getting those really, really expensive speakers for your home stereo. Oh, you had to mention that, didn't you? Because you know I am one of those high fine nutters. There is a lot of par there's a lot of crossover. If there's a Venn diagram, it, the photography and high fine, there is a, a crossover in the middle where I where I live. Um, now, just before we wrap up this video, you mentioned it does it does film video, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, but it's I think it's a bit of a joke. I don't know why they bothered to even put it in the camera. So, video it shoots only 1080p, 25 frames a second. Only 25 frames per second. 25. That's it. That's as so that's great, great for people in a nice European PAL region like me. Um, bad news right. for you in North America. Yeah. yeah, you can't do 30 or 24, I don't think. Only 25. But not only that, but it's a five-minute maximum on the videos. Yeah, but it's five minutes of superb quality, right? Well, hang on. First of all, it's manual focus only. There's no autofocus in video. Um, so if you want to do any kind of 
uh, focus pulling during the video, you're going to have to do it manually with the uh, with the lens that makes it less than predictable. Good job. You can mark on those predictable things as you turn them. Oh, no, you can't. Don't you wish you could do that? Yeah, no, you can't do that with this. So um, and what's really strange is in the in the electronic viewfinder, the video on this camera, at least there might be something wrong with it. I don't know. But it the, had this horrible greenish cast to the image in the viewfinder. The video itself was fine but it was very green in the viewfinder. And to make matters worse, there's a lag of about a full half second. So if you pan or you have motion, you're a half a second behind, which again is means great videos for um, you know people who aren't moving or things that aren't moving. So um, yes, it has video. I can't imagine someone spending $8,000 for this body to shoot video. For the perspective, man, for the perspective. It's to get it's to capture footage that looks different from anything else. Yeah, at twenty five so, frames per second. So I guess it's time to wrap this up. Um, have I answered all your questions? You have. You have. Okay. Good. Because I think ah, oh, I wanted to love the camera, and when I took it out of the box, I said, "Boy, that's pretty." I think design wise, it's quite triumphant. It looks nice. Um, it feels nice, and I love the user interface. And they've obviously put a lot of effort into all of that. I think the thing that they're facing, though, is is the fact that because of the mar- because of the, uh, market, uh, not not demand, but because of the volume that people like Sony and Canon and Nikon can sell, they can throw so much money into sensor development that it's hard to keep up with them. And their sensors are just performing so well now uh, uh, on the full frame point that it's hard, really hard, for a specialist sensor like this to kind of keep up and compete in a way. So it's, it's I, I don't know, it's maybe lost, medium formats lost some of the edge that it that it's had in the past. I, I don't know. I don't know what, what I mean, I, I, I commend them for taking the, you know, that 40 and $50,000 price level and bringing it down below $10,000. That's a big step. And there are other cameras, you know, here's a, you know, here's a, a Leica M10, which is up there at the, whatever it is, $7,500 range also. That's not an inexpensive camera. Um, but I mean, to give you an idea uh, again, why I like it here is an a seven, uh, sorry, an a nine. Now it happens to have a bracket on it at the moment, uh, you know, an L bracket, but it's essentially the same size as the Sony a nine. Um, so I fell in love with it. Just the looks of it. I love the, the touch menu. The menu system is excellent. The image quality is great, but it's expensive and it, doesn't really give me anything that I can't get with a camera that cost half as much. That's the bottom line. That is the bottom line. And that's the end of the show, I guess. I guess it is. I really enjoyed that. What did everyone think of that? I think we should have more of Doug. More Doug. It made my life much easier yeah, the, anyway. The only, yeah, the only problem with that is people don't realize how much work goes into the actual viewing. Recording the video, editing the video, that's the easy part. What you don't know is that Gordon spends weeks shooting with the cameras, and then he spends who knows how much time writing those detailed reviews. So um, I'm glad to go back to our normal show format, and I look forward to the next one where you do all the work and I get to ask the questions. <laughs> well, let us know what you think if you want to see more. I want to see more, Doug, anyway. So uh, you did a great job there. Thank you very much for that very detailed review, Doug K. As always, uh, if you want to see more of our uh, reviews, you can subscribe to us on YouTube. We'd really like you to do that. If you're listening to the podcast, you probably already subscribe. iTunes, please rate us. It really helps. And if you like what we do, why wouldn't you? You can treat us to a cup of coffee and that keeps Doug and I going. And of course, if you're ever shopping for anything online, do it uh, via our links at camelabs.com. That really helps us too. Um, so that's that's it. Uh, if you want to see more of Doug K, go to DougK.com. Find out what he's doing uh, if there's a, a workshop coming up because he's a great fella to shoot with. So thank you very much, Doug. Um, do you have any final words? No, thank you, Gordon. I'm glad we made it through this. Excellent. I'm getting anyone who got this far <laughs> through this show. Well done. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you'd like to see more medium format uh, content, because this, I think, is the first one that we've reviewed together, then let us know because, uh, you know, we could get in the Fujifilm GFX or, or any of the others and um, and see how, see how they measure up. Uh, but in the meantime, check out our other shows and uh, we'll see you next time on the Camera Labs Photography Podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. See you later. <laughs>